Hey there, Sebastian here. You know, the podcaster listener relationship is too unbalanced. You know us a lot better than we know you, and we want to narrow that gap. So please do me a favor and answer our audience survey. It takes four minutes, and it will help us to continue producing content that informs and inspires you. You can find the survey at epicenter.rocks survey. And at the end, I'll tell you how you can get a free KeepKey hardware wallet, courtesy of Shapeshift, to thank you for your time. So thanks in advance, and on with the show. This is Epicenter, episode 331 with guest Ryan Selkis. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Ryan Fabian Quinn. Hey, Brian. Good to have you on the intro for, for once. It's been a while. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're recording this actually over the weekend. So, you know, it's one of the reasons why we need to record the intro fairly quickly because uh, this will go out actually just in a few days. And so today we are doing something a little... A little bit outside of what we usually talk about, which is uh, we talk about the coronavirus because it's on everybody's mind, of course. And well, who better to have on the show uh, in the crypto space to get that uh, coronavirus crypto overlap than Ryan Selkis, who's been quite vocal about the coronavirus on Twitter and on his blog. And Yeah, no, I was super, I, I mean, I've been uh, pretty obsessively following this topic now for uh, quite a few weeks and, uh, you know, been... Ryan's news, excellent newsletter at Masari. If people not a subscriber to that, I highly recommend it. You know, it was one of the first. You know, there was a few kind of places that I got alerted for this fall. I think it was like Jay Guan of Cosmos, who was like very early on, started tweeting about this. It was Ryan Selkis who started writing about it on his newsletter, and you know, he's done a fantastic job at kind of like covering this. Yeah, we had Ryan on and could talk about this topic. I mean, super important. I think at this point, probably. Most people have realized, but it's yeah, yeah. we do seem to be at a, 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 a really critical point, both in terms of you know on 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 a lot of different metrics. So in terms of like how the markets have reacted, uh, although you know it, it could go even worse, but uh, we've we've seen like a significant effect uh, on the market, but also just in terms of how states are starting, especially in the West. Uh, are starting to react. So, you know, in, in Europe, like where we live and, and also in the US, uh, although to varying degrees of severity, I'd say, and urgency. Yeah, so in the podcast, we really covered uh, a lot of different stuff. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about why this thing has become, you know, so deadly, what, what, the, what the scenarios are, you know, some of the really negative scenarios here. Also talked about containment and why Ryan is actually very bearish on this and thinks it would kind of like miss the boat there and there's going to be a or you know there's going to be a, a deep pain coming especially in the US where he, he's focused a lot of his attention on then we talked about what you can do to protect yourself uh you know we talked about the, the fed response government response the markets on that end we talked a bit about what it means for crypto you know what it means for crypto startups uh, what it means for the crypto market for Bitcoin, and yeah, we talked also a lot about what's going to happen in the long run. You know, where are the opportunities here? How it might uh, drive some change and maybe some good things coming out of this in the end. Uh, even though probably what is ahead in the next six months is going to be pretty dark, but I think in the end there's always opportunity in crisis, and this one will be no different. Yeah, that's true. I mean, there's always the the light at the end of the, of the tunnel. Just uh, how long is that tunnel? How dark does it get? And when do we start seeing the light? Is um, I think the question on a lot of people's minds right now. I mean, like we we talked about this during the podcast. So this is slightly tied to you know what I talked about on the bonus episode last week about ETC. Is that well, you know, a, a lot of us uh, who are at C ETC uh, are um, you know are sick or or maybe are, are worried that maybe we've contracted something and question for me, for instance, is, okay, well, I'm sick. I was sick before ECC. I don't have any severe symptoms, but at which point do I go outside? You know, is it when I feel better? And at that point, how do I know that I still don't have a virus or that I don't, I haven't contracted something and I'm, I'm not just asymptomatic? So there's a lot of questions I think that people have. And I think until 
people's confidence that this is really gone starts to to increase, then you know people are just going to stay indoors and you know, not much will happen. Um, on, on that note, uh, there is a um, just because I was at ATC and a lot of you were too. There is a spreadsheet uh, that we'll link to in the show notes, which transparently talks about like who has been contaminated and who's positive uh, and what events they were at. And so you can add yourself to this list. You should if you have anything to report and also uh, see if you should take the right precautions to protect yourself and your family and friends. Before we go to the interview, I'd like to tell you about our sponsors for today's episode, starting with Status. And I'm so excited to tell you that the Status app has been out now in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store for the last few weeks. Once you've installed it, please join the public channel Epicenter. Come and say hi. And if you ask us, we'll give you some SNT tokens so that you can get started with an ENS domain name, for example. Status is so much more than just a messaging app. In fact, it's a network of projects with a common goal. And that goal is to help build the tools that enable sovereign, open socioeconomies. And their team is really driven by this principle. I was at ETC a couple of weeks ago and I sat down with Corey Petty and Dean Eigenman, both of the Status team, to talk about this vision. And we talked about all of the tools and infrastructure which make up the Status network. So we talked about the app, of course, but we also talked about Keycard. I have one right here. It's uh, a secure, contactless, open source hardware API. It fits in your wallet. It's like a credit card. Uh, Embark, the all-in-one developer platform for building and deploying dApps. There's Subspace, the front-end development library. They're doing uh, research on implementing light clients in ETH 2.0 with Nimbus. And there's also VAC, which is the modular peer-to-peer messaging stack that Status leverages. So we'll release that interview shortly since we're still going through all the content. But if you want to learn more about Status and everything that they're building, go to statusnetwork.com. And to get the app, just download it in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. We're also brought to you by shapeshift.com where you can get started and trade dozens of crypto assets on the industry's leading non-custodial exchange. You know, back in the day, back in 2014, 2015, when Shapeshift sponsored the show at the very beginning, we used to talk about them as the Google Translate for cryptocurrencies. You know, you plug Bitcoin on one end and you get Ethereum out the other. Well, it's so much more than that. You can trade crypto to crypto, but you can also buy crypto with fiat. You can trade track and secure your digital assets in one place. I don't know if you've seen the new Shapeshift, but it's fantastic user interface. It's easy to use. You get all your crypto assets in one place. And if you sign up at beta.shapeshift.com, you'll get 100 Fox tokens. What do you get with these Fox tokens? Well, each of these Fox tokens is worth $10 in free trading per month, which means you start on the platform with a thousand bucks in free trading. I mean, that's, that's a great deal. You can connect your Ledger wallet, your Treasure, or your Keep Key. And if you've been listening to this podcast for the last little while, you know that we're giving away a free Keep Key hardware wallet to anybody who fills out our survey at epicenter.rocks slash survey. So go to beta.shapeshift.com to get started and be sure to do our survey to get your free Keep Key. And with that, here's our interview with Ryan Selkis. We're here with Ryan Selkis, CEO of Masari. Thanks for joining us today, Ryan. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy you agreed to join. And, you know, today we're going to finally speak on this podcast about the topic of coronavirus and COVID-19. You know, I, I've been following this topic now, I guess, intensely, maybe for three uh, for a month or something like that. But I uh, also just wanted to thank you for, uh, you know, for being really early and covering this topic super well and uh, informing, you know, the crypto community and, and your listeners. So readers very well about this so thanks so much and thanks for coming on today sure uh yeah thanks for uh thanks for having me on standard disclaimers i'm not a doctor i'm not even that smart but i am smart enough to listen to bology when he calls me and he tells me to pay attention to something that could be a global pandemic in late january so uh all credit there i'm just happy that i was able to provide a bit more of a megaphone and and that you know fortunately i've got an audience where some folks have listened to me cool so Let's start a little bit bit of background on this. When did you start looking into coronavirus and why did you feel you wanted to talk about this publicly? It's funny. I kind of had this, it was almost like out of a, a pandemic horror flick. I was, I was working out right before a board meeting in mid-January in San Francisco. Is that one of the, um, 
one of the gyms right across the street from my hotel. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I finished a set of my workout and I look up at the TV and I just see the Chiron on CNN talking about the, the Wuhan coronavirus uh, confirms, you know, X number more cases or, or, or whatever it was at that point, you know, like 20 or 30 because uh, it was still small numbers. And um, I didn't really think, you know, much of it, but I was you know starting to at least pay attention to it, thinking about, you know, what that might do for the global economy, uh, because for a while, I, I think I've been waiting for some sign that we could uh, tip into a, a recession after a 12 year bull market. It, it's, you know, what goes up must go down eventually, at least at, at times. And uh, a week or so later, I had a conversation with with Dan, my co-founder, where, you know, he, he was saying, hey, are you, are you are you looking at all this? You know, we, we, we might want to come up with some contingency plans for Masari or think about, you know, work from home policies or when we would pull the trigger if, if this thing spreads. And um, at the same time, I saw Bology tweeting about it. Bology's an investor in Masari and, and, and I shot him a note. And uh, and said, hey, your tweets are freaking me out a little bit. What's what's going on? Is this, you know, how, how bad is this thing going to be? And he ended up calling me and, and, he, and we spoke for about an hour and a half. And he kind of walked me through everything that he was reading and, and gave me some initial sources to poke through. And once I went through the Johns Hopkins dashboard and, and some of the other, you know, off the shelf materials that um, many of the folks that were early to this were, were thinking through. You know, Twitter accounts that were smart. You know, uh, different you know blogs that were covering this. Uh, I spent about 24, 48 hours just pouring through everything, and and then kind of quickly went down the rabbit hole. And you know, fr- frankly, a lot of my responsibilities on the on the sorry and, and crypto side uh, started to fall by the wayside that week, and and I you know more or less hit the pause button and uh, delegated you know, more to the team and communicated that I'd be delayed with, with some of the things that I had owed people because I felt this was something, you know, at, not, not even as a public service that I had to, to push, but I, I thought it might be a potential black swan events that would impact our business, that would impact the industry. And, and you know, even if it was just a 10% chance case at that time, it was gonna significantly impact the planned travel that we had. Since we were thinking about a trip to Hong Kong, to to Singapore, and, and to Beijing in March and, and early April, so um, I guess the timing was was somewhat lucky because there was business reasons uh, for me to look at this from a, a travel perspective, but it was also you know quite fortunate that uh, that Balaji had, had joined our last round and and he was generous with his time and I wasn't thick enough to just ignore it and and, and carry on with my day. Well. Let's let's dive. I mean, most people that will listen to this, or everyone, will have at this point kind of like heard a little bit about coronavirus and COVID nineteen. But I think it's still worth if you spend a little bit of time here to just explain what's going on here and you know why this could have such a massive impact on the world. Well, it it already it already has. It already right? has. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what happens, I mean, even even if there was a you know, miraculous turn of events. And this thing just dissipated with the warm weather, which, you know, most health experts seem to not believe that's going to be the case and are planning for the worst case scenario. Uh, you know, some some hospitals in the U.S., you know, the best guess uh, epidemiology of this is that there could be, you know, half a million deaths from the coronavirus in the U.S. But uh, let's just say, you know, for the sake of argument that this thing dissipates with the warm weather in the next, you know, couple of months and we're kind of nearing the peak of uh, fear in the in the broader market. Well, that doesn't really change the fact that we just did, you know, one and a half trillion dollars of QE and rate and, and slash race to zero. It doesn't change the fact that we've got this, you know, unprecedented stimulus. It's probably going to be bigger than the than the troubled asset relief program TARP and in, in, you know the 2008 bailouts. It doesn't change the fact that uh, restaurant workers, five and a half million of them in the US, Median salaries somewhere in the low twenty thousand, uh, twenty twenty five thousand dollar range. Their jobs are at risk because the restaurant business is down thirty five percent year over year this weekend, and it's declining and, and really falling off a cliff. Uh, and it doesn't change the fact that you know a, a lot of folks are going to be you know, massively disrupted because of the unforeseen healthcare costs uh, that are, are very much up in the air in terms of how that gets paid for. Um, or childcare costs if they're forced to either work from home or, or their kids are, are forced home from school. So no matter what happens, 
my biggest focus, at least initially, was what are the what are the economic impacts of this thing going to be? Now, unfortunately, it also seems like the health impacts could be bad on an almost unprecedented scale if, if this isn't taken seriously, which is you know one of the reasons that I think um, you know I and, and so many other people haven't taken this so seriously. And it, and it comes down to healthcare capacity and the, the percentage of, of critical cases. So you know, if you if you think all the way back to you know six whole weeks ago uh, when Wuhan in the Hubei province of China was was shut down, they had 444 cases on January 23rd. Uh, that city shut down on January 23rd, and they took unprecedented measures to quarantine the population there, to in strict, uh, pretty draconian uh, self isolation schemes. They had fast, you know, drive through testing uh, capabilities. They're building hospitals within 10 days. The Chinese were able to mobilize, you know, their their national workforce um, in the medical community to to flock down to Wuhan and, and really get a ha- handle on this thing. And even with all of that, the case load went from you know 444 into the you know 80,000 range or you know a little bit higher than that, um, with several thousand deaths. So they barely uh, averted crisis, I'd say. And in the early days. The fatality rate of, of you know this novel f- coronavirus and, and you know this, this flu-like virus, it was upwards of six percent. Now, disproportionately impacted the elderly, disproportionately impacted you know men, probably because they were smokers, and, and there's you know major social imbalances in, in smoking rates in China. But really, what that rate signified was that the healthcare system, once it gets overrun, there's kind of no turning back in terms of how bad all the critical cases can can get. And with this disease in particular, every single piece of literature or every single medical expert or epidemiologist that, that you know, I followed and, and tried to absorb as much information from over the past six weeks, it, it seems that the critical uh, case rate is, is at least 10%, probably closer to 20%, of which a good chunk of those are going to have to spend time in the ICU. And that gets especially, you know, exacerbated if you have, you know, co comorbidities or, or are otherwise more susceptible to this. In the U.S. Uh, and the West, that's very bad news. We've seen now what's happening in in Italy with their healthcare system, you know, more or less being overrun. And uh, and you know, being here in the U.S., it's been surreal the last couple of weeks. And and last week in particular, watching, you know, uh, the the national address from 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 Trump. Followed by the the Thursday market sell off, and then the you know inexplicable rebound on Friday. It, it doesn't really seem like many people are are still taking this seriously. It's uncharted territory, but we'll we'll see. And as I felt from day one, hoping that I'm very wrong about this, and just being a little bit of a chicken little here. Yeah, yeah. Because I mean, just to just to go sort of the characteristics of the thing that make it so hard to contain or the one hand we have something that's like extremely infectious something that can be transmitted without people having symptoms right so people spreading it without being aware of it and goes very far and very quickly Uh, and then of course yeah it's just the severity as you as you pointed out right that a lot of people either die or they have to go to the hospital they have to get medical attention and then as we've seen right in china and italy iran maybe that yeah that just completely overwhelms the response and then now we we have we are now seeing uh, a lot of responses like let's say you know here in Berlin schools are all closed right kindergartens are all closed like events basically everything's getting cancelled right so th- this is there is now you know they're starting to test like widespread so there is this response coming I guess the key question is going to be and I think that's sort of what you alluded to right with when they started doing that in Wuhan you know whether it's too late. And whether the responses are like strong enough, like so. What, what's your take there? Do you so your I guess your opinion is that you know at least in the U.S. it's it's too late. Do you think which countries are going to be able to kind of still get this under control versus not? I mean, I I, I have no idea. But the thing is, I don't think anybody really knows. I just the only thing that I can really speak to is my my perception of a lack of seriousness. Or, or urgency uh, on the part of, of many in the West and, and in the U.S. in particular. And I do think a good chunk of that has to do with the political polarization of this being an election year, an extremely uh, one-of-a-kind 
never before seen president in the U.S. Maybe in terms of the way that he communicates and and you know makes decisions. And uh, the the piecemeal approach is maybe the the scariest thing because when Wuhan was shut down, and the Chinese were able to mobilize you know thousands of, of personnel and, and ship equipment and do these uh, really incredible and been incredibly rapid countermeasures to to prevent a, a, a broader nationwide outbreak, um, they were dealing with the epicenter. And it, it started in a city of one. In the US and, and throughout Europe, you're seeing this now, there, there's a chance that multiple cities hit Wuhan-like levels at the same time, but with nowhere near the flexibility, speed, or, or uh, existing capacity to actually keep an outbreak in check once it's actually spread. You know, what's happening in testing in the U.S. is, uh, you know, I think it's a national disgrace how slow we've been to roll that out. The U.K. has, has you know, seemingly made its bet that, um, you know, the, the the Brits are going to need herd immunity for this and everybody's going to get infected. And look, that that's probably true. But if you get a couple of those calculations wrong and, you know, the infection rate accelerates and you can't, you know, quote unquote, flatten the curve, then, you know, the system gets overrun and, and your critical caseload, instead of it being, you know, 1% or half a percent fatality rate, it, it ends up being close to, you know, 3 4 5%, which, which is a lot worse. And the thing that, you know, freaks me out a little bit, you know, just speaking personally, I mean, I'm in, I'm in pretty good shape, early, mid 30s, but I've, I've had asthma. Most people don't know how fucking scary it is when you can't catch your breath. Like they have no idea. It's unclear whether even some of the people that fully recover, if they ever get their lungs back, because right now the, the severe cases that have come out of the hospital that have recovered, you know, many of them are still showing permanent damage or, or at least significant damage that might take a long time to rebuild in their lungs. I think there's a, also a perception issue with how this affects people at lower risk. So I don't know if you've followed this journalist at the New York Times, uh, Donald G. McNeil. He talks about this massive study that was done in China where a large percent of the population was only what they called like mildly affected by this. But like the criteria for mild goes all the way up to pneumonia. I think like for most people, like pneumonia is not a mild, like mild symptoms or like mild effects of a virus. And then the other thing is too, just people that have asthma or might have high blood pressure or diabetes or smokers, for instance, you know, might be affected by this uh, in far worse than, than people who are in sort of better health or you know, aren't smokers. I'm not sure when this episode is going to go out, but this is a you know, viral clip that was just out, I think, yesterday with uh, McNeil on Rachel Maddow on MSNBC. And, yeah, and there's a six minute clip where he talks about, tactically speaking, what the Chinese did that was so effective and why they were so effective uh, and, and why some of the Asian countries have really been ahead of the curve on this. And um, it's night and day. Congress in the U.S. has criticized Trump for breaking families apart up uh, immigrant families. Well, you know, the Chinese have done it and they've managed to curb the growth of coronavirus, right? Americans are spoiled. Everybody knows that. We come to other people's country and we wear like, you know, USA rah-rah t-shirts and we're boisterous and, and obnoxious. And I just generally think that we've had it so good for so long that no one has any appreciation for what could be coming. Hopefully it just disappears and there's some, you know, key variable that no one really thought of or the virus mutates and it becomes less deadly or, you know, whatever. Let's hope that that's the case. But so far, you know, hope's a pretty fucking stupid strategy um, if it's not backed in, in any, you know, reality. And there are ways that you can help yourself instead of just, you know, relying on blind faith or hope that, that we're going to get through the other side. What is the best strategy for protecting yourself and your family, practically speaking? I don't think anybody really knows all the, you know, science around the transmissibility and, and kind of, you know, when you're at risk or who's at most risk or susceptible. You know, the good news is I have two little boys and this doesn't really seem to be affecting kids. So that's good news. My wife and I, knock on wood, are, are you know, relatively healthy, like I said, and, and young. So that's good news. But um, I'll just tell you, you know, from our part, uh, we've got uh, several months worth of, you know, food and, and provisions. I feel like every single week that goes by where things get worse, I add a month or two of provisions. So we're exponentially growing our, our, our provisions as things get worse instead of just like dipping into it, like some people might be tempted to. And then just, you know, self-isolating, right? So the last trip that I have made or have to make one more quick trip today, and, and this is the March 14th we're talking about, 
is just uh, prepping our balcony so that at least we have some you know outdoor space where the kids can run around. But I'm not anticipating we're going to be spending much time with other people uh, in the next couple of months. That's probably the, the biggest thing is is just, you know, we're not going out. And it, it, for people that are in the city, that, that sucks. And that's why I think it's going to be that much harder to contain because the weather is getting nicer, especially in cities like New York. The winters are awful, right? Everybody looks forward to spring and just, you know, gets cabin fever, wants to get outside. The weather is getting nice at maybe the exact wrong time because now everybody's going to want to go out and, and, and congregate. So, you know, just staying put where we are is, is you know, probably the, the best bet. And just minimizing, you know, contact with everybody else. The only thing above and beyond that that we sprung for, you know, I do have some masks, but I didn't hoard them. I don't have like a zillion of them. I have enough in case we need to do like runs or, you know, my wife's pregnant. So I am assuming that we're going to continue to go to her prenatal OB appointments. And and if she needs them or or I need to take her, then, then we have those at our disposal. But other than that, it's just, you know, having plenty of food and wasting time with anyone except for in virtual reality, which we can talk about. So I, I think this has been sufficiently dark so far, uh, maybe. Let's get darker. <laughs> we can keep getting darker. I, you know, I, I think the one thing that I'm very happy that I did with respect to our company and team is we bought everybody Oculus Goes. And a couple of us, you know, uh, actually sprung for the the quests, the, the slightly more expensive. And I got to tell you, I'm not a gamer I've not been into VR. I've not played a video game in probably two decades since I you know, started playing sports instead of video games when I was in middle school. And they're just wild. And the teams love them so far. So we've done some VR hangouts. You know, uh, some of the, the managers doing one-on-ones in VR. Just it's a little bit more interpersonal. You are fully locked in when you're you know in the matrix versus you know just being on zoom and then kind of toggling back and forth between twitter or turning off the screen for a second and like grabbing a snack i think one of the better moves that we made in the camp of okay this sucks but how do we mitigate some of the social losses so we all just don't go nuts or we don't lose productivity and and i think that extends both um you know to the workplace culture but also you know interpersonally i'm i'm trying to encourage more of my friends uh, to get these you know, VR headsets before there's a shortage and they're just stuck reading books or something catastrophic like that. I've done a lot of the same things. So I've been like last, I don't know, three weeks or something, basically had almost no social contact and you know, just being at home. But the, the VR thing is uh, definitely something to try out. I mean, we're going to be hosting a ton of meetups. Uh, you know, we just on Thursday, um, you know, as you guys know, I used to run Coindesk and the, built out the consensus series. So, you know, for the last three years, I've wanted to get back into the events game because uh, I've done pretty well putting them on and, and people like the experience uh, from when I was a producer before. And B, I just know that it's, it's you know, great for economically, they're great if you pull them off uh, in terms of community building, business development and, and information flow. There are you know, a ton of benefits to being very good at, at event production, particularly in this industry. What I didn't want to do is I didn't want to fill the calendar with another live event because it's, we're already so full of events internationally um, within crypto in particular. This has changed things up a little bit, and, and we were actually planning a small virtual event around Blockchain Week in New York this May. Coronavirus kind of kicked into high gear. And we said, well, we need to throw some more resources at this. Eventually, things got so out of control that, of course, now uh, Consensus has moved their Ethereal Summit online and Coindesk has moved their summit online as well. So we're going to actually push that back events. But we have a ton of ideas for how to make a virtual attendee experience light years ahead of anything that we've seen so far. I think the platforms that are there are interesting because of this forcing function to get more people into VR, there's a lot more that we're going to be able to do in terms of virtual hangouts and meetups as well that aren't just like Zoom dial-ins. If people want to kind of stay up to date here, is there a website uh, they can go to? or It's at mainnet.events. So mainnet events. Cool, cool. So yeah, we'll put that in the show notes. Let's dive a bit more into impact this is going to have on, on, you know, on the world economy. So something's obvious, right? Right now we see you know, tourism is basically dead and is probably going to stay dead for, I don't know, six months at least. And then you have other industries, right? Like events, concerts, restaurants, right? So there's a bunch of industries that are kind of very obviously hit. Obviously supply chains as well with China's factory struggling. So that is going to have a lot of impact. What is your take on 
just like what is ahead of us here? You know, are we heading for a recession or depression on the scale of the financial crisis or something even bigger? And like, what do you think are going to be the key determinants that are going to kind of shape how bad this will get? Well, I think first you have to think about the impacts and whether it's already been bad. The answer is yes. And there's a couple, you know, major differences between this and, and the financial crisis. You know, the, the financial crisis in, in 2008 was entirely the result of weapons of mass destruction in, in the financial market, right? The credit derivatives and, you know, credit default swaps and, and over leverage in the derivatives ecosystem. So that was, you know, ultimately a, a liquidity issue. You've seen some federal reserve stimulus and, and you're going to see some more fiscal stimulus in the U.S. and internationally as a result of uh, the pressures of the coronavirus, but you can't print your way to manufacturing at a greater clip. You can't print your way to you know more healthcare capacity. You could print your way to financial services companies having capital buffers and, and sufficient reserves, but you're talking about physical versus digital. And 12 years ago, it was it was really about digital. And, and eight years before that, with the dot com bubble, it was it was very much the same. It was just you know paper gains evaporating. It wasn't cogs of the machine grinding to a halt, which I think is is very very different. So you know so much of how bad this gets, I think, ties back to how effective some of the major Western economies are at containing this and avoiding the worst case scenarios over the course of the next couple of months. And then after that, how quickly capacity is able to come back online. It sounds like uh, from what I've read, and it's actually hard to get good information out of China right now, just because all of the the information groundswell and flood is you know all focused on the West now. So I've actually been trying to go out of my way to, to you know, figure out what's going on in China, at least from an economic standpoint, because if they're able to turn all their factories and capacity back online and shipments are able to you know, start coming back through, then um, at least from a, an economic standpoint, perhaps some of the fallout can be mitigated. I think this is at least as bad as 2008. But honestly, my guess is as good as anyone else's. I'm not an economist, but they don't know what the fuck they're talking about either. And they certainly didn't a month ago. So it's a very overused term. And, you know, frankly, I was a little bit wary to come on and, and talk about this subject beyond what I've already written, which is much more thoughtful, uh, just because I know people are going to say, well, you're neither a medical professional, an economist, uh, an epidemiologist, you know, public policy expert, you know, whatever. But with black swan events like this, no one really knows. So everybody's just winging it and trying to use, you know, common sense to put all the puzzle pieces together. And I, I think the one reason I feel not confident, but at least comfortable talking about this is if I'm wrong, that's a good thing, number one. And if I'm not wrong, then at least I've been able to tick and tie and footnote all of my assumptions and, and where all my beliefs are you know, getting informed and, and, and coming from. One thing I've been pondering and I would be very curious what you take is and it sort of ties into like what will happen in China as well is so you know we have these social distancing measures now and you know they're increasingly getting more severe and stepped up and you know let's say they will manage to decrease infection rates a lot and you know hopefully get this under some sort of control and you know I guess we'll see how bad it is but one thing that is unclear to me is like when are you actually going to be able to say we can relax those again and we can go back to some sort of normal. Like when can you say again, okay, it's fine to have a concert with a thousand people or it's fine to have, you know, open restaurants again, to have a conference. Do you think this is going to take us, you know, like a year and a half down the line when there's vaccines or, you know, will we be able to get there earlier with this like widespread testing or like, how do you see the, the path going back to normalizing it? No one knows. If you just look at all the information that's available today, I would find it pleasant, but not to be expected surprise if things dissipated over the summer and we were ultimately able to contain and, and crush this type of outbreak. I think you probably need herd immunity. You probably need most people to get this over a, a couple year period and or have the vaccine release rolled out, mass manufactured and, and ultimately distributed. To, uh, to everybody that needs it before you can truly feel confident that this is properly tamped down. I thought was the worst case scenario in some of my early posts, which is, okay, let's assume 50% of the world gets this. 
or 40%, just to use round numbers, all right? 40% of the world gets this, the 3 billion people. If 2% ends up being the, the fatality rate, once you've factored in a hospital overwhelm in some regions, but you know lower fatality rates in others, or kind of this, this variability in, in when people get infection, say it's 2% or say it's 1%. Well, if it's 1%, that's 30 million people that die from this, which is a pretty big number, but 60 million people die every year globally. You're only talking about a 50% one-time spike in the overall rate of fatalities at the, hopefully the worst case scenario. Yeah. And some of those people were probably going to die anyway. Exactly. Like your probability of dying any given year in your 80s is, is you know, in the double digits. If your fatality rate from this is, you know, 15%, you know, 20%, whatever, that's still only impacting your personal probabilities by a factor of two versus an order of magnitude. So that outcome is is ultimately not catastrophic from a, a global perspective if it happens. It's just all of the uh, secondary and, and tertiary issues that, that are, arise from that if we don't get the assumptions right and, and you don't control the chaos. If you can control the chaos and that's the worst case scenario, it's still pretty bad. A lot of people are, are you know, going to experience pain and suffering, people lose family members. But at the end of the day, it's it's not you know crippling to the world order and and, and economic structures, and it's not going to you know put us sink us into a global depression. The, the number of variables you have to manage, are, it, it's just complete chaos. So so no one knows, and I think you would much rather roll the dice, especially in the West where you have reserve currencies, even if they get put under extreme stress. You probably want to roll the dice on overcorrecting in the short term because. You can always print your way out of any economic hardship that service workers might have, and then you can have a massive stimulus program on the back half of this to kind of make up for some of the lost temporary growth, just like you would like a hurricane or a snowstorm or some other natural uh, disaster, which you know there's precedent for. But the big difference, of course, is that you've never seen anything like this that would impact entire countries, continents, global population all at once. Normally, if you have a tsunami, it can be very, very bad, but it only impacts one region. Forest fires, same thing, and, and so on. So I would certainly put the uh, the impact at somewhere between recession and depression if we keep fucking it up like we've been doing uh, in the West. The one thing that I will say, though, when it comes to crypto and when it comes to, to startups, I think the one thing that this does is it totally resets the startup fundraising ecosystem. So one of the couple of highest impact things that I think uh, could happen in the next couple of years for startups is, uh, at least, you know, I'll speak from a US-centric perspective. The accredited investor rules need to be relaxed pretty much immediately because you need more liquidity and, you know, more capital capable of flowing into the private markets in addition to the public markets. I think you need to raise the caps on Reg A plus and Reg CF in terms of the amount of money um, some of these companies can raise from non-accredited investors because the venture capital market is just going to completely seize up. And the other thing that you could do if you fix the accredited investor rules, you could open up some of the top performing funds and you know basically create uh, pools of LP capital from non-accredited investors, non-institutional investors that, that could you know flow in much more easily. So all of the venture funds that are trying to raise follow-ons don't have trouble replenishing their own coffers. You're still going to have massive you know liquidity issues, but for any incremental improvements that you can make to the fundraising process and to making it easier for startups to not run out of cash is going to be pretty critical. I think overnight, the entire startup funding ecosystem is just you know completely reset. And that's going to have trickle-down effects in the coming quarters and, and years, really, as you know, startups lay people off and you know, even in the best case, de- uh, you know, limit their, their hiring pace. So speaking of trickle-down effects, uh, I'd like to come back to the situation in the U.S. and I mean, perhaps even more globally, the situation in, in Western countries and, and how... Uh, they've been dealing with this. So the Fed just reduced uh, interest rates to zero and injected like a massive amount of stimulus into the economy. In Europe, we're seeing a slightly different approach, at least here in France. The approach is, is to sort of help small businesses and help people go through this crisis by offering uh, to, let's say, you know, pay their mortgage payments or this sort of thing. But let's focus on the US for a moment. What does the Fed hope to do by injecting all of this new uh, money into the market, and to allude to something you said earlier, like you know, if the machines, if the cogs stop turning because people aren't 
going out and eating at restaurants and going to work and producing. But what does that money do? What is it for? And what can people expect to benefit from this stimulus? There's two types of stimulus. The one that was announced last week was, you know, the Fed's easing and, and kind of treasury interventions to drive down interest rates and um, just infuse unprecedented amounts of liquidity in the in the repo markets. That's one thing, right? But like I said before, that only keeps the treasury market properly functioning. It doesn't necessarily have any impact on the Main Street consumer or you know individual that's impacted. So the, the much bigger thing that you need to watch for and understand is how quickly some of these fiscal measures are going to get rolled out and how aggressive they're going to be. So that's, I guess this stuff just passed last night at midnight, so I haven't even had a chance to catch up on it. But um, I know that there is a pretty sizable package that uh, is on its way to the White House for signature and should include a combination of tax relief and you know, a variety of other measures that are designed to limit the blow for everybody in the U.S. right now, uh, at least in the short term. How effective those are in terms of creating structural improvements is anybody's guess. Again, it, it's if the entire global economy grinds to a halt for several months, there are cascading effects to what that means for companies as they think about you know, keeping employees or laying them off uh, when it comes to you know, whether they're able to service their debts or not. I'm sure you guys are probably in this boat, but you know, I've canceled a number of personal subscriptions just in, in the last week. You know, we've cut our personal you know, burn rates and our T&E budget is basically going to zero, <laughs> right? Outside of like Netflix and a couple of you know, things for the home. Everybody's doing the same thing at the same time, and, and it seems like it'll have a, a massive uh, short-term deflationary impact. But what I think will be fascinating to watch is when this gets resolved, what happens next? And this is kind of where the, the rubber meets the road for us in, in the crypto realm. Anyone that's shilled on Twitter or, or, or wherever about Bitcoin or, or crypto being a, a safe haven during a global recession just doesn't know what they're talking about. They never did. They probably never will. For the most part, the folks that I know, trust, you know, respect, that think about crypto as, as an investment asset class, have never thought about this being a, a flight to safety or you know something that you want to own when all hell breaks loose like 2008 or, or like we're seeing today. But instead, it's a hedge against all the other monetary systems failing in the background. So if this only lasts a couple of months and unprecedented money printing, you know, revitalizes the economy and the engine starts to get going again. Will we see some currencies, you know, enter periods of hyperinflation or will we see people start to, you know, flock into Bitcoin and other crypto assets because their inflation rates are close to zero and, and you know, by extension, that makes this look like a more attractive investment than a negative yielding bond, which is going to be the norm, I think, for quite a while in, you know, the US and, and Europe in particular. The title of this podcast could maybe just be too many variables uh, because I know I keep saying it, but all the mental arithmetic that I put in the back of a napkin to think about how this could play out. A best case scenario is governments take this extremely seriously. They rev up the printing presses. They throw unprecedented capital at this problem. A vaccine is developed and mass distributed. We limit deaths globally to the low single digit millions, which still puts this, you know, 10x as bad as global flu, but still manageable. And then, you know, we have a severe but short-term recession in which, you know, after which time everything, you know, starts humming again. And a, a chunk of investors, once they're more comfortable, will look at what's going on from, you know, inflationary pressure standpoint. And at that point say, we should have some, some crypto allocations. So that's at least on the monetary side. I think there's, you know, a whole slew of things that could be, you know, interesting on the, um, on the Web3 thesis side as well. I think on that side... I'm also wondering, you know, just to what extent this will change in the long term, the structure of markets and the relationship between government and private enterprise. So in Germany, they have announced that the government will basically like lend money to like any business in trouble with the virus. Now, I don't know exactly the parameters and stuff like that, but I would not be surprised, right, if that would in the US, right, the government by trying to help the shale oil industry and if you have these massive, massive interventions in markets, right, you're basically saying, okay, we're going to try to save all those businesses that, you know, would have been affected by coronavirus. Like, how do you step that back in the end? And if you have in the end, all of a sudden, maybe the government being a, a creditor to all these companies, because, you know, they said they all were in difficulties with coronavirus, gives a loan, or maybe on the other side, 
having the Fed or the government basically going and in, in directly intervening in the stock market and buying up shares. It just seems like a crazy world ahead of us. That's the best case scenario. Yeah. <laughs> In Germany, and I think France will have a similar approach, although they're not lending money specifically, they're offering clemency to companies so that they don't have to pay all their social charges. So basically all the charges you would pay you know, for employees and things like that. And they're also offering uh, unemployment benefits to all the restaurant workers, for instance, that are not going to be at work. But the market has this, this ability to sort of weed out bad companies, companies that would fail anyway. But it, in this case, at least in France, like there's, it's indiscriminate, right? So like if any company, like Epicenter has employees in France, and so we pay social charges. We just need to send an email to the administration and say, like, we can't pay these. Who knows? Maybe we would have we would have folded in three months anyway. But it's totally indiscriminate. And so the the state is basically uh, intervening in the market in a way that is uh, absolutely unprecedented. It's like in two thousand eight, right? You had like too big to fail, and then they stepped in and said, "Okay, oh, these banks, we have to save." But what if it's basically the same kind of approach, but for all businesses, everyone? It's like nobody can fail. When it comes to any type of fiscal or monetary response, I'm just in a perpetual state of shrug emoji. I think we lost the window. I think I think that people in the West, our leadership in the West are so fucking cowardly that nothing positive is going to happen. I'm disgusted. Like there's no leadership anywhere in the West. We're fucking spoiled. We don't take things seriously. Nobody understands the need to take things seriously until it's already too late because everybody likes to shit on anyone that's, you know, being a, a turd in the punch bowl and raising a, a justifiable alarm. And then the best part is if you actually do that right, you may be prevented something catastrophic. No one will ever be the wiser because they'll just say, oh yeah, remember that that flu and, and we took it so seriously. And and there was only like, you know, 20,000 people that died. It's the same as like the typical flu. When really, if you hadn't taken any action, well then, you know, millions of people would have died and the, the economy would have gone into depression. Those are basically the two camps right now. And then, you know, the third camp is just like the hope and, you know, thoughts and prayers camp, I'll call them in the West, right? It's the same thing that we do after every single mass shooting in the U.S. Thoughts and prayers, but nothing actually changes. So maybe one day thoughts and prayers alone will be able to help us. But in a situation like this, it'd be nice if, if more people took it seriously and were scared out of their fucking minds. Absolutely agree. Well, let's talk. A little bit about markets. So we've had uh, an insane week in the stock markets right, with some uh, fastest drop ever, I think. The S&P 500 completely crashing and you know, stock markets everywhere. Uh, the treasury bond markets right, have also gone through an enormous amount of insanity. And so did crypto, right? So we had crypto uh, crash, uh, Bitcoin, I don't remember what it was, 40% in a day. What's your take on that? Do you think this has kind of like adjusted to the reality or I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of volatility still ahead but do you think to some extent it's kind of like priced in what's ahead or not yet I don't think anyone yeah too many variables right I'll, I'll go back to that it's just you know like it all depends on on the response it all depends on you know what the what the rate of the slope is if things keep accelerating in a negative direction then of course this is not priced in if things start to level off then yeah, maybe maybe the worst is over from a market standpoint. But I think uh, crypto will probably be a leading indicator on on the rest of the market at this point because, like I said, I think you know crypto was going to get eviscerated like any other risk on asset, which is really how it's traded historically because so many of the speculators are, are in it for you know the hundred thousand or you know, million dollar upside long term. But you know once you've washed those weak hands out of the market in a liquidity crunch, you can kind of take a step back. And if the unprecedented you know, economic stimulus that takes place over the course of the next six months, year, kicks into high gear, crypto should be a, a pretty meaningful beneficiary of that, at least when it comes to you know, the monetary pitch and, and you know, the uncorrelated asset pitch. We haven't seen that. We've never seen an inflationary recession. Um, it's always been you know, something that people thought about uh, as, as you know, possible. It's certainly why I invested early on. I know it's why many other early people invested early on. And quite frankly, you know, there, there are thresholds that I'm going to continue to, to load up on, on Bitcoin if things get worse, right? Uh, the only reason I wasn't buying more the other night when we hit 3,900 is because I was locked out of my account. But I'm not going to name names as to which company uh, prevented me from uh, from accessing uh, my capital for that trade. Suffice it to say, 
I missed that window, but there could be other windows like that in the uh, in the days ahead. And I'm not alone, right? I, I mean, I, I there is a certain lower bound, I believe, to the crypto price because there is a diehard enough community of believers in this long term macro narrative that Bitcoin provides, where the nominal value of all total Bitcoin will be low enough that someone will take cash and buy at, at that lower bound price, right? And so, you know, right now, what are we at? Like 100, 100 billion market cap, something like that, give or take, right? Uh, I, I didn't check it, you know, right before we came on, you know, for 5,400 or whatever. Uh, let's call it, you know, 100 billion in, in, in total market cap. Well, you know, net out Satoshi's coins, you know, maybe 90 billion of that is actually, you know, currently owned float. If we go down to 3,000, you know, now you're in the $50 billion neighborhood. It doesn't take that many deep pocketed investors that are worried about gold, that are worried about their national currencies, that are worried about their governments in this type of, you know, global recessionary environments that um, that, that doesn't get bid up. So I don't know what the lower bound is, but I know that there are different thresholds that I will personally back up the truck. And I am a minnow compared to many other people that I've known in the industry that uh, that feel the same way. Yeah, no, I know. I agree. Let's speak a little bit about, you know, what, what are the long term effects on this, maybe from a societal perspective in terms of just sort of changing how the world works, how maybe business works. And you alluded to uh, Web3 as well, you know, what this kind of means for crypto, like where's the opportunity here for crypto decentralized networks in the medium and long term? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd written about this a little bit uh, in my post on, on Sunday night. And, you know, I think everybody's talking about some obvious ones, uh, remote first software, VR, online gaming, online education, e-commerce, right? You know, anything digital or, or, you know, that requires less, you know, physical interaction. I also think that um, in terms of the losers, San Francisco is maybe a uh, they're a an example of a city that will will likely you know suffer some some pretty meaningful human capital shocks from something like this. If a good chunk of workforce management moves remote, if a good chunk of your engineering talent finally moves international, and those local ties become you know less important, then then this could accelerate what is already a a slow ebb in the uh, tech scene from from San Francisco. Uh, and that could be, you know, much more acute in in the in the you know months quarters ahead. Um, and you know, we've already seen it. You know, a bunch of defections from within crypto to cities like Denver and uh, Austin and even New York, right, from San Francisco. I think uh, you know we already talked about the impact on the startup ecosystem. I think this probably should be the death of the American health insurance system, it, which just needs a radical override. I'm I'm not necessarily advocating for any particular economic model, but this kind of exposes all of the flaws in our employer-sponsored healthcare system, which by the way, folks that are not American might not know is a relic of World War II because there were controls on on wages with people coming back from the war. And uh, a loophole uh, that employers were able to exploit was to offer other ancillary benefits to their employees to compete for talent post-World War II. So this is an entire accident of history, right? Unintended consequence where employers that never should have been involved in, in healthcare in the first place got involved. The world's a lot different now, uh, and and you know probably makes sense to retire that given given the stresses that you know this pandemic is is likely to put on the U.S. healthcare system. If we pay the most per capita for healthcare and fail the most catastrophically in managing this outbreak, I think it's fair to say that we should blow up and start the entire system from scratch. How likely do you think that is, though? I mean, like, it's such a, a politically charged issue that, like, do you think that even this can radically change the U.S. healthcare system and at its most fundamental level? I'd say the, the better question is how many million deaths does it take, right? If 100 million people get infected and the case fatality rate is 2%, and we hit that or exceed that, and 2 million people or more die, and their two, three, four week demise is ultimately live tweeted and broadcast in social media and blogs, and it becomes permanently ingrained in the American psyche. 
I don't think there's any way that any American in a, in a crisis you know, scenario like that could possibly think that, that the, the current system that we have is, is an acceptable alternative. I mean, pardon me for sounding a, a bit grim here, but just looking at the political landscape, and again, I'm, I'm not an American and, and I don't live in the U.S., but who's most likely to benefit from the healthcare system and who's most likely to suffer the consequences of the healthcare system? And how do those people typically vote? I think it's probably across the board. You know, older Americans, I think, skew uh, more Republican, right? Younger, you know, more, more liberal. Uh, but in terms of healthcare coverage, younger more liberal, um, lower income. So it, I think it's, it's, it's across the board. You've got you know, a, a lot of different demographics in that. When you're talking about something as, as massive as healthcare coverage, I think it's, um, it's, it's tough to you know, put people into you know, one political bucket there. But uh, I think you know, if, if there is a reset in uh, the American healthcare system, then I hope Bology is, 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 is part of the redesign because he's, uh, he's called everything uh, pretty well so far. He's got a you know, ton of great ideas. And uh, I know there was a rumor going around that he was in the running to be uh, FDA commissioner back uh, in, uh, in 2017. And uh, you know, certainly wish that had been the case in, in many respects. But um, there's just so much that has to change uh, in, in the U.S. healthcare system. So there is, you know, kind of one edge case where if things get, you know, pretty, pretty freaking bad, um, not nuclear and, and, you know, putting the U.S. in, in you know, long term depression bad, but, you know, bad enough from an optic standpoint, from a social urgency standpoint, then you might see some positive changes to how our, our healthcare system structured. You mentioned the, um, the the McNeil interview at, at the onset here. I mean, if you just contrast how quickly the Chinese were able to move on this versus anything that we've been able to do stateside, it's it's just night and day. And and uh, I mean, it's embarrassing, frankly, that um, that we are so far behind in this, and, and it doesn't even seem like there's anyone with a coherent plan to uh, to actually you know bring this under control. Yeah, I mean, that definitely seems to be the case. Just one more question about about markets. What do you think would be the market reaction if we found out that Trump had COVID? Uh, limit down twenty percent. I'll I'll end on a on a positive note, right? You know, I generally think that you know life goes on, people get past things, but to just you know kind of throw your arms in the air and say, oh, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Th- that's what's that's what's maddening to me. So you know what what I think is a silver lining in all this is you're going to see a next generation, I hope, if things get bad, you'll see a next generation of, of, of leaders emerge that, um, that took this seriously, that take it seriously, that, that you know, run to the proverbial front lines to help uh, in the crisis versus exploit the crisis. And the biggest thing that I think we need right now, you know, in the U.S. and, and you know, internationally is, is just, you know, some semblance of, of courage and duty and, and a march solidarity a march for solidarity exactly i i think you're going to see plenty of people that are are in that camp i hope it's the vast majority and the more people it is the sooner it is the better chance we have that this goes away in a couple months and everybody gets to talk shit to me on twitter indefinitely because i'll just be like one of the chicken littles that was blowing this wildly out of proportion it was just the flu and you're such a pussy and blah 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 i i really hope that's the case i feel like past a certain point, even if it does get worse, right? If we go into the summer and it, and it doesn't succeed and, and then we continue on to next year, perhaps, let's imagine like that worst case scenario, you know, people will adapt. Like humans have a, an incredible ability to adapt. And we're already seeing hints of that. If you look at like, you know, Italy, like people singing, singing on their balconies or whatever, like, you know, human ingenuity and their ability, our ability to, uh, to face hard situations is, is pretty incredible. And so I think that even if uh, we're highly hindered as a society, we'll find ways to adapt. And like VR is a way to do that, right? Like remote work, we'll, we'll find ingenuitive ways, I'm sure. The, I think, you know, generally speaking, the, the best case scenarios are always, um, you know, when you have like a, a, a severe and like a, a very fast rip the bandaid off type of negative moment, but then, you know, tons of little positive, you know, incremental wins on, on the staircase back up because you want to see like the dopamine hits on the way up because they're just more frequent and it really doesn't matter what the magnitude is, um, on the way down, get it all out of the way, adapt, move on. 
and then you know just get yourself in a in a state where where you can move on uh, to the next challenge or or recover from a, a pretty major setback. I think the thing that's so frustrating is you just see the response and no one wants to rip the bandaid off, right? It's just this like deluge of negative headlines, negative days in the market, negative political bickering and and just a, a feeling of, of helplessness, uh, I think, from from so many people. I think that's going to turn around. By the way, I, I personally think that, you know, come hell or high water, this this will be turning around sometime in, in June or July. And it's just a matter of like how severe and 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 how um, how how bad things get in the interim. But I I find it hard to believe that one way or, the, or, or another we're not at the light at the end of the tunnel stage by uh, you know sometime early summer. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Ryan. It was uh, it was great. Are you sure? No, absolutely. No, it's uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> great course. speaking with you, and I think the you know the kind of effort you've put in. Yeah, it's just inform people about that. It's been great. Uh, we'll, of course, link to also your documents. So you've had a Google Doc, a very big Google document at this point that you've kind of kept up to date with lots of resources. So we'll link to that. We'll link to you know, a bunch of other resources. One thing that maybe I can recommend here that I've been listening to uh, religiously in the last, uh, I guess, almost month now is a podcast called Macro Voices. Yeah, they've done an amazing job of covering this as well. So there's been a bunch of really great resources. So we'll, we'll put those into the show notes so people can you know, learn more about it, uh, about you know, what's going on, how to protect themselves, how to deal with this. And yeah, so how to get through this. And yeah, I mean, I think in the end, there, there will be lots of, of course, we'll come out of this, right, as a, as a society. And there will be lots of, hopefully, positives as well emerging from this. Yeah, so in the meantime, thanks so much, Ryan. Well, thank you. And, and I guess as a, a, a parting word here, just to make things a little bit more real, uh, Tour Demeester just tweeted that there's 39 potential COVID cases uh, from ETH CC Paris, including Vitalik. Including me. <laughs> are, are you on that list as well? I mean, I'm not on that list, but I'm, I'm self-quarantining uh, because I've been sick. I was sick since before ETH CC and I'm still sick. So, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I was thinking about that conference before it happened. I was like, this is a bit, you know, maybe a bit reckless, a bit risky. Although to be honest, in my estimation, actually with EFCC, I was sort of thinking like, you know, probably still okay. But if they did like a week later, it would be... Yeah, that's exactly what, what I was thinking too. Yeah. That was sort of my thinking a bit, but I was like, you know, I personally wouldn't go. I think it's a bit too risky. But uh, I think that's also the astonishing thing, just that, you know, exponential growth is... Even if you know that this incredible growth is coming, it ends up being so fast and so powerful. It's still still shocking. And uh, yeah, I think we're seeing that. And well, hopefully at least the lessons learned that, you know, one has to be very careful with these events and uh, not do them for a while. I am going to shamelessly shill mainnet.events as a closing point there because I think the community is going to need some places to um, to rally. And we've already publicly committed to donating 50% of the profits to third parties. Uh, whether that's charities, I don't know. Whether that's um, different development efforts or, or community funds, uh, just to ensure that that you know different major crypto projects don't run out of money to be determined. But um, but. We want to make as much money as possible for this event in uh, in June. That way uh, we can hopefully be at least part of the solution here. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week. <laughs>